Army headquarters somewhere behind the lines near Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. The situation here on this third day of July, 1863, is very serious for the federal forces. Two Confederate attacks have been repulsed in two days of heavy fighting, but the northern casualties have been severe. The federal line is badly shaken. There is serious concern as to whether it can successfully withstand the next attack expected any minute from the crack Confederate troops of General Lee, those troops which for the last two years have yet to lose a single battle in this war between the states. General George Gordon Meade, at a press conference held a few moments ago, announced that he expects the Confederate forces under General Robert E. Lee to make... July 3rd, 1863, Gettysburg. You are there. This is the most serious moment of the war between the states. If Meade fails to hold Lee here at Gettysburg this afternoon, the nation's capital will be at the mercy of the victorious Confederate troops. President Lincoln will be under increased pressure to accept the Confederate demands for peace. At this very moment, according to CBS reports from Washington, the Vice President of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens, is at Fortress Monroe in Chesapeake Bay under a flag of truce. He's waiting to be received by President Lincoln. If Meade's army is defeated here today on the soil of Pennsylvania, there may be many more who will say that the North had better make peace with the South. And that would mean a nation permanently divided. It would mean the dissolution of the Union. That is why military experts here at Gettysburg are convinced that this battle may be the turning point of the war. And here to discuss the possibilities of the situation is CBS News analyst Richard C. Hotlett. There has been an ominous silence over the Gettysburg battlefield since 11 o'clock this morning. Then General Slocum's Federal Corps regained its position on Copes Hill, the right anchor of the Federal line. However, General George Gordon Meade, the Federal Army commander, has not been deluded by this local success. He knows that General Robert E. Lee, the Confederate commander, has yet to throw the full might of his forces into a final attack. I'm convinced on this third day of battle that the attack will not come at the round tops, the left anchor of the Federal line, for good reasons, for 20,000 reasons. 20,000 dead and wounded Confederates and Federal soldiers. I saw them fall in yesterday's violent fighting in a peach orchard and a wheat field when the Confederates under General Longstreet attacked the Federal forces under General Sickles' Third Corps. I'm also reasonably sure that the Confederate attack will not be directed against the right flank of the Federal line at Copes Hill and Cemetery Hill. And here's why. The Confederates under Generals A.P. Hill and Ewell attacked there last night and were beaten back by troops under Federal Generals Slocum and Howard. The only point of the Federal line that the Confederates have yet to test is the center under General Hancock, and that's where I think the attack will come this afternoon. Major General George Gordon Meade has been in command of this Northern Army of the Potomac for only five days. He's in a tight spot. I talked with him last night after a council of war at his headquarters. He admits that he's somewhat superior in numbers and supplies and he holds a strong position. But the Confederate troops here at Gettysburg are flushed with an unbroken string of victories. These men of Lee's Army of Northern Virginia have never been defeated. They believe they can do anything, and they're determined to smash this Federal Army this afternoon and claim it as perhaps their final victim and end this war. Oh, here's a message. Confederate artillery has come out of the woods opposite the left center of the Federal line. We have a CBS reporter right there. Go ahead, John Daly. Ten Confederate guns have been wheeled into position, one mile in front of me and a little bit to the left. The guns were brought up a few moments ago, but the Confederates who brought them have disappeared back into the woods, leaving the guns as far as we can see unattended. It may be that General Hunt, the Federal Artillery Commander, will move up more Federal Artillery, although I don't see how that's possible, for Cemetery Ridge here is lined with Federal cannon, almost wheel to wheel. There are over 80 guns on this ridge. There's no secret about it, for the Confederates can certainly see them and count them. There's still no sign of any artillerymen around those Confederate cannon over there, and while we wait for the Confederates to make up their minds about what they're going to do, I want you to meet two privates from the Northern ranks. First of all, Private John Byrne, citizen volunteer, native of Gettysburg, and 72 years old. That's right, isn't it, Private Byrne? Yep. Private Byrne has snow white hair, deep set eyes and three bandages, one on each arm and one on his left leg. You told me a while ago, Private Burns, that you got those wounds in the first day's fighting. Is that right? Yep. Did you get them all at once? Nope. Well, Private Burns is modest. The, the fact is that he's a veteran of the War of 1812. He's got a farm here at Gettysburg. And when the Confederates came, he got his old musket and powder horn and joined up with the famous Wisconsin Iron Brigade. In the fighting that followed, Private Burns was wounded in the right arm taken to the rear and his wound was dressed. He returned immediately to the front 
was wounded in the other arm, was taken to the rear once again. His second wound was dressed, but he came back and was wounded a third time, this time in the left leg. But even that didn't stop him. Right, Private Burns? Yep. Well, don't you think that you've done enough fighting for one man, Private Burns, especially for a man of your age? Don't you think Listen, that... Listen, mister, don't start telling me where I belong. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it that way, Private Burns. I'd like to know why you volunteered. They took my cow. Ain't got no right taking my cow. Is that the only reason you're fighting this war for a cow? That's one reason, mister. It's a good one, ain't it? Well, uh, what are some of the others? I'm a cobbler and a farmer. And I've lived on this little piece I got here for over 70 years. I'm not too old to work it, and I'm not too old to defend it. And, mister, I don't know whether you know this either, but if we lose this battle today, I not only lose my cow and my piece of property, but we lose the union. We lose this country. And that's something I fought for in 1812, and I'm fighting for it again. Thank you, Private Burns. And now here's another federal soldier, Private Tom McGaw. He's tall and lanky, freckled, with a, a mass of red hair shooting out from under that blue cap. Well, what do you think about those Confederate cannon over there, Private? What do you think it means? I don't know. Well, uh, how old are you, Private McGaw? Eighteen. Will you speak a little bit louder, please? Eighteen. Eighteen. Well, I understand that that's the average age of half the Northern Army here today, Tom. It seems to be awfully young, doesn't it? I don't know. Well, why are so many young ones like you here? Well, uh, uh, after the Battle of Chancellorsville, most of the older fellows' time was up, so, so they went home. Oh, I see. And then uh, youngsters like you volunteered to fill the ranks. No, sir. I was drafted. Where are you uh, from, Tom? Illinois country. And what were you doing when you were drafted? Working in my dad's store. You married? <laughs> well, what are you blushing about? Have you got a sweetheart? I guess so. Does she write to you? About every two weeks. Well, uh, whom do you miss the most? Your mother or your sweetheart? You miss them both, don't you? Yes, sir. Well, Tom, how do you like the arms? The Confederates are moving more artillery out of the woods into the open position beyond the Emmitsburg Road, which runs diagonally through the battlefield. I can't see what's going on very well, but Ken Roberts on big round top two miles to my left can see them better, so over to Ken Roberts. It looks like the whole works this time, John. Looking through my glasses, I'd say about 75 guns on good ground over on my right. They're moving them along the Emmitsburg Road from the Peach Orchard northward for about 1,300 yards. Some of the cannon are as close as six or 700 yards from the northern line. The Confederates are beginning to point the guns, most of them are Parrots and Napoleons, toward the center of the Federal line. In some of the interviews I've had here with the veteran northern officers, they said they can't recall such an unusually heavy concentration of Confederate artillery at one point. And there's no telling how many more guns are screened in the woods further down to the center and on past the center, all up and down the long Confederate line. Ned Calmer at the far right of the Federal line has news of cavalry action, so over to Ned Calmer. I've just received a report that a heavy force of Confederate cavalry has ridden far around and behind this right flank of the Federal Army. At this moment, it's been intercepted and engaged by Federal cavalry under Generals Kilpatrick and Gray. It's almost certain that this surprise cavalry movement is part of the Confederate tactics now shaping up rapidly. In other words, while the Confederate cavalry, presumably under General Jeb Stuart, is trying to turn the right flank of the Federal Army, the main Confederate attack will try to break through its center. We haven't heard the Confederate artillery open fire yet, and we have no news about the progress of the cavalry engagement, but we expect to hear in a moment or two and meantime, by special permission of Federal General Howard, and with the consent of the man himself, I'm going to let you hear from a Confederate prisoner of war taken in the action on Culp's Hill early this morning. He's a huge, brawny man, about six feet tall, dark, sunburned, heavy, bushy beard. He's wearing reddish homespun pants and a shirt, a broad-brimmed wool hat, and brand new shoes. That's right. Plus shoes, and a hat since this war started. Where'd you get them, soldier? Over yonder, Gettysburg. Day before yesterday, when we kicked the daylights out of the Yankees and stole them out of town. Do you think you're going to enjoy wearing those shoes in some northern prison camp? Northern prison camp? Man, where you been in this war? <laughs> Don't you know Mars Roberts gonna bust this Yankee line wide open this afternoon and take me to Washington with it? You're pretty confident, aren't you, soldier? Why, sure. You remember what Mars Roberts did to the Yanks at Manassas? 
You remember what he did at Sharpsburg? You mean Antietam? No, sir, I mean Sharpsburg and Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville. Every time we was outnumbered two to one, and every time we wailed them. And you trying to tell me that today is going to be any different? Yes, but this Yankee cavalry down here at Gettysburg has those new Spencer carbine soldiers. They're the first repeaters ever used in this war. They shoot eight times, and yours only shoot once. Yeah, but we know how to aim, boy. Then you don't think much of the Yankees as fighters, is that it? Suppose they'd fight pretty good if they didn't have to tote such big loads. You know, they... They're in the toting business. They ain't in the fighting business. <laughs> Man alive, I don't see how they can move with all that stuff on their back. <laughs> I, I forgot to ask your name, soldier. Where are you from? I'm uh, Jim Crocker. I'm from Mississippi. Well, if you're so certain of winning, Jim, maybe you'd like to tell us where General Lee is going to attack this afternoon. Ooh, what's the matter, boy? You scared, huh? <laughs> you stick with me. I'll take care of you. Uh, wait, a, wait a minute, soldier. A note has just been handed to me. General Stewart's cavalry has been repulsed behind the Federal lines, and now they're riding back to the Confederate lines as fast as they can. That ain't got nothing to do with a cannon up yonder. That's where the Yankees gonna get it. Nothing's happened up there yet. They've been out there for some time. Well, there's something that happening was a now. You that? About two miles to my left. There's another one, same direction. It's near the center of the line, so over to John Daly. The Confederate artillerymen, one mile across from me, are swarming around their guns in plain sight of our position behind this little clump of trees. They've opened fire with mass guns. The Confederates are firing on us, shells screaming right over our heads. The horses here are rearing up, staying in sight. Look out! One of them has broken away, is galloping past me on the battlefield. Fire, splinters, and shells are flying through the air on the ridge just behind me. Artillerymen are falling, oak and iron axles, bones and wheels Don Holland back at Federal Headquarters behind the lines. We, we've lost contact with John Daly at the center of the line, so we'll switch now to Ken Roberts at Big Round Top, two miles to the left of Daly. Come in, Ken Roberts. This is Ken Roberts at Big Round Top. From my perch way up here, I can see the Confederate gun firing and their shells falling at the center of the northern line. And now there goes the Federal artillery blazing out an answer to the Confederates. The entire northern line, for two miles from my vicinity to Cemetery Hill, has opened up in full force. The smoke on both sides is thickening and rolling across the battlefield. It, it's beginning to converge now in one big black canopy, blackening out the sun. It's awfully difficult to see anything, but through the smoke I can hear and see roars and flashes of flame as the shells find their mark again and again, exploding caissons, blowing up batteries. The casualties on both sides must be enormous. This is the greatest artillery duel I've seen in this war. There must be at least 180 guns firing at each other, a tremendous concentration of artillery. The Federal guns are concentrating on the Confederate artillery, but the Confederate guns are not only going after the Northern artillery up there on the ridge, they're throwing their shells over and to the rear of the Federal lines. Their fire is unusually heavy. It, it must be directed either against the Federal reserves or, or possibly at Meade's headquarters. We haven't heard from them. Let's have a report from there. Go ahead, Don Hollenbeck. This is Don Hollenbeck at Federal Headquarters behind the line. General Meade narrowly escaped death a few moments ago when a Confederate shell exploded here, killing one of his aides. The general and his staff have ridden farther behind the lines, out of range now of the Confederate fire. Now the northern fire has stopped. I don't know if it's been knocked out or what, but the Confederate fire is still going, and it's especially heavy. Shells are exploding all around. This little whitewashed farmhouse is still taking a very heavy Confederate fire. What's that? The Confederate fire is stopping. I don't know what that means. The damage here at Federal Headquarters is terrific. It must be a terrible shambles up in the center of the northern line. We've been trying to make contact again with John Daly, but we haven't been able to since the start of the cannonade. So we'll switch again to Ken Roberts on Big Round Top to see what's happening. Go ahead, Ken Roberts. This is Ken Roberts. 
Something's going on over on Seminary Ridge in the woods up there. I can see the Confederate soldiers do... This is Don Hollenbeck at Federal Headquarters. We've just established contact again with John Daly at the center of the Federal line. Go ahead, John Daly. The Confederate infantry have come out of the woods one mile across from me, thousands of them. They've halted. They're dressing the line right and left. It's at least three quarters of a mile long, a straight line of men in butternut and gray. Rifles at right shoulder as if on parade. Their battle flags are coming out, coming out of those woods. And I can count five, ten, there must be at least twenty battle flags up and down the line. They're red deepened by the sun. Up here on the ridge, Union artillery is pulling into position. Through my glasses now, I can make out among those battle flags the 14th, the 18th, the 19th, the 57th Virginia. They belong to General Pickett's Virginia Division. I can remember seeing those same blood-red banners at Fredericksburg. There's the 22nd and the 34th North Carolina. They must be under General Pettigrew, and there come the 1st and 14th Tennessee, the troops from Alabama, Mississippi, many more. I think some of them are under General Trimble. Still, they keep on coming. A second line has come out of the woods. It's forming behind that first one. That first gray line hasn't moved yet. It's still there, dressing its formation. All of this in full view of the Federal line three quarters of a mile away. There must be at least 10,000 Confederate soldiers over there now, and there comes some more. It's a third line coming out of the woods. There may be as many as 5,000 more. I'm still using my field glasses. I can see a Confederate officer on a big black horse riding up and down in front of that first line. He's wearing a blue overcoat in this hot July sun. I think it's Garnett of Virginia. The Federal artillery reserves up here are ready. The infantry behind the wall in front of me is tense, expectant, and strangely silent. Through my glasses, I can see another Confederate officer. He's on horseback also. He's placed his hat on the tip of his sword. He's pointing it at this direction, and he's shouting something to his men. It must be the signal to advance. Yes, it is. It is the signal. That dull gray line is moving forward, marching, marching in common time. Lee's proudest, finest bearded veterans, some of them in uniform, many of them in civilian clothes, wearing straw hats and caps. They're aristocrats and barefooted mountaineers, the flower of the South, the men who glory in close-in fighting. They're marching now with unbelievable confidence, and they're headed right up here. The Confederates are a little over a half a mile away, still in perfect formation, except that each flank appears to be gradually closing in, to be converging toward this clump of trees where I'm standing. It looks like they mean to hurl 15,000 men right at this point of the Federal line. I just can't believe it. Not a shot has been fired on either side. They're still coming on. Their long gray line gets narrower and deeper, pushing over fences in their way. They stride through fields of wheat and stubble and tall grass, nearer and nearer to the Emmitsburg Road, which is just about in the middle of the battlefield. 200 yards the Confederates have marched. Not a, not a shot has been fired. The northern guns are right behind me, and there they go. There they go, the Federal cannons all up and down the cemetery ridge are firing. The blast is directed against the Confederates advancing on my right, and Confederates are falling by the tens, the hundreds. The flags are beginning to go down, the battle flags. But those fearless soldiers keep right on coming at that same measured pace with scarcely the fire of a single Confederate rifle. The Confederate columns have reached the Emmitsburg Road less than half a mile across from us. They're pushing right through the fence. The northern guns are tearing great bloody gaps in the southern ranks. Now they're through the second fence on this side of the road, and that Confederate battle line is dressing again. I can't believe my eyes. It's fantastic and stirring up and down the line. In the face of this murderous federal fire, they're dressing their formation. Now the bearded southerners are moving forward again. They're bringing their rifles down. They're charging at double time. Their rebel yell is rolling up the ridge here. They're coming at us. I can't stay here any longer. Under the Get the hell out of here. Get off. I've got to fall back. Take it, Ken Roberts. Go ahead, Roberts. Go ahead, Roberts. This is Ken Roberts at Big Round Top. The Confederates, about two miles up to my right, are charging hard. They're charging with cold steel toward the center of the line now where John Daly was. Now, now the northern infantry has opened up, a flash of flame and a roar. They're playing havoc with the charging Confederate lines. Here at two miles, all I can give you is a general picture. Too much is happening. There goes a the Confederate officer blasted off his horse, but he's back on his feet. It's the man with the hat on the point of his sword. 
I can I can see him pointing his door at the northern line. And there goes the first Confederate body for these 5,000 rifles. Now, the Federal infantry seems to be wavering. The cannoneers behind them must have been cut to ribbons by this murderous Confederate fire. The smoke and, and, and the dust of the fighting makes it hard to tell exactly what's happening up there. John Hollenbeck, can you hear me? Are you getting any reports from the battle? Yes, Ken. Couriers are coming down here to headquarters all the time, but so far we don't know much more than you can see from round top. The fire's terrible. We can only guess how bad it is by the wounded that are beginning to come in now. Oh, here, we've just had a courier report that the first line has been hit hard. Can you see anything? Yes, yes. The Federal infantry is falling back. The northern line is breaking. The blue-coated men on all sides are running back. About 5,000 Confederates have stormed the ridge. They've broken the Federal line. The ridge is theirs. And they're charging the Federal guns. They're swarming around them. Oh, oh there goes that gallant Confederate officer. He's down. He's down. And now the broken Federal line is reorganizing and... Uh, and they're charging back to retake that part of the line, the only part that gave way. The Confederates are being forced down into an angle of a stone wall. It's a bloody angle. The Confederates are crowding around their battle flags, flags that waved so proudly before, now being cut down one by one. I can see the Northerners closing in on the right, left, and front. The Confederates are in a death trap. They're lost unless they can get reinforcements right away. And through my glasses, I can see those Confederate reinforcements, but they're going the wrong way. They can't see their objective because of... Ken Roberts, Ken Roberts, battle. John Daly is back up in the center of the line again. Let's give it to him. Go ahead, John Daly. The little clump of trees is ours again. The Confederates are retreating. They're falling back. Confederates all around me are raising their hands, surrendering, throwing down their guns and their swords. It's the only thing they can do. No human being could stand up under such fire. Just in front of me and a little to my right, I can see the body of the gallant Confederate officer who led that charge over the stone wall and advanced further into the Federal line than any other Confederate. His body is hanging over the Federal cannon, left hand on the barrel. His right hand is still grasping his sword, his gray hat pegged down on the blade, clear up to the hilt. He is one of what must be it, at least 10,000 Confederates who either have been killed, wounded, or taken prisoner in the fighting here today. Now here comes the Federal Commander, General Meade. He's riding fast down the northern line from my right. That roar you heard was the entire northern line standing up and saluting him with a cheer. I'm going to try to get to him as he passes. He's dressed in his familiar summer uniform of dark blue without badge or ornament, except for the shoulder stripes of his braid and a light straight sword. His hat is cuffed over his bearded white face. Here he comes now, General Meade. General Meade. General Meade, General Meade will you say a word, sir? The battle is ours. Thanks to us, the Union is paid. It's victory, victory for the North. Unbelievable victory on the very brink of defeat. General George Gordon Meade, the Commander-in-Chief of the Federal Army, has just declared that today, July 3rd, 1863, Lee has been stopped on the heights of Gettysburg, and the Union... Gettysburg, July 3rd, 1863. Pickett's gallant charge fails and the high tide of the Confederacy is turned back. <laughs>